Normally most of you that are watching on the periodic videos see me doing really bonkers things like setting fire to, to chemicals, <coughs> throwing alkali metals into water. Oh, but I thought we'd come back to the lab today because just last week we've had some really, really good news and a really good result for our team. Because contrary to popular belief, we do real science too. And uh, we've been really lucky because our, one of our articles was published last week and as you can see here, it's actually featured as a, as a cover article on, on the journal Chemical Communications. This is a, a journal from the Royal Society of Chemistry which has got quite a good esteem amongst chemists. This paper highlights some work which we've been doing for about three years now and that's trying to measure what the electrons are doing really near metals in solution, so ions in solution. So there's some big problems there you see because to measure what the electrons near the nucleus or the core electrons are doing you have to use really really quite complicated techniques that involve x-rays so particularly things like XPS. XPS is a it's a really really nice technique called x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy so we take a sample and we crash x-rays into it and when it crashes in it emits lots and lots of electrons these are called photoelectrons and these photoelectrons are like fingerprints for the chemical species that are at that surface so if you've got an iron atom it gives rise to an iron photoelectron if you've got a sodium atom it gives rise to a sodium photoelectron the problem with XPS and similar techniques is that when the photoelectron comes out from the surface it has to fly all the way to the analyzer without bumping into anything else okay now if we think about this lab if a photoelectron came out of my hand for instance it would go less than a millimetre before it bumped into a molecule of gas. So that energy would change, so it would no longer look like a hand photoelectron, it might look like something different. So we have to remove all of the particles from the atmosphere, all of the gases, all of the other small molecules, so that we can get what we call a collision-free environment, so that the photoelectron can go from the sample all the way to the analyzer. Now then, the problem is that I want to use XPS to look at metals which are dissolved in solution. Now this technique requires high vacuum so normal solvents like dichloromethane, ether, petrol will evaporate the instant that they go into our equipment and they, then we won't be able to measure solutions. So we had to use a different technology to allow us to put a catalytic solution into the XPS. Now my group specializes in chemistry called ionic liquid chemistries. Now ionic liquids are quite unusual because they're a bit like a solid and they're a bit like a liquid. You can dissolve things in them but they don't evaporate so they're like a solid. So here is a sample of an ionic liquid. This is a simple ionic liquid that my group made and you can see that it flows like a liquid but it's quite thick and treacly. So we've dissolved catalysts in these solutions and put them into our machine so that we can look at the liquid properties of that metal so that we can see what happens to that metal in its core electrons close to the nucleus as we do chemistry. Okay, so we've come downstairs now in the School of Chemistry and this is the XPS room. So essentially we have to put a sample inside and XPS as I said uses high vacuum so you can hear the pumps which are sucking out all that atmosphere and sucking out all of that air. Now we have to put our sample into this chamber and it goes right in the middle of this central chamber here. And traditionally you could only put solids in this type of machine but my group was one of the first in the world to put liquids in without having to chop and butcher around with all of the instrumentation. The reason why we could do that is because we were looking at ionic liquids which don't evaporate at normal temperatures pressures. Why, do, why don't they evaporate, Pete? Well that's quite a hotly debated topic but it's because with an ionic liquid you have an anion and a cation and they have very very strong coulombic interactions or ionic charges which pull them closer and closer together. So this actual bond is very very strong and it's very very hard to evaporate them. So the sample goes into the middle and if you look through the glass here you can see there's a sample in and it's a solid sample today. When we did this experiment we put liquid samples inside the instrument so that we could look at liquids and, and solutes that were dissolved in those liquids. Because if I put a sample like water in there or a similar organic solvent it wouldn't even get into the chamber because it would evaporate instantly. It evaporates so you couldn't analyse it but it would also cause significant damage to the instrument. The way this instrument works is that we put a sample inside 
and then we shoot x-rays at that sample. So this is the x-ray gun. And essentially what we do is we take a stream of electrons, which are very, very hot and very, very fast, and we crash them into an anode surface. Okay? When it crashes into that surface, it emits x-rays, lots and lots of x-rays of many, many different wavelengths. The next thing we need to do is to choose the wavelength of the, the x-ray that we want. And we do that by monochromating it with a big crystal. And this is the monochromator. So the x-rays go into the monochromation crystal where they bounce off the crystal surfaces and we can select a particular wavelength which we then expose to our sample. So the monochromated x-ray is then shot down at the sample inside the chamber where it excites all of those photoelectrons. The photoelectrons are then collected by a series of lenses inside this box where they're collimated and then thrown into a, an analyzer and that's the big box at the top. And we have to play around with the electronics in that box so that we can separate these photoelectrons because of their energy or their fingerprint for their atom. So we collect these electrons, the photoelectrons, and then we combine all of the pictures that we generate into a spectrum. And this is, this is a picture of a spectrum which is actually collecting at the moment. And you can see it's quite a noisy spectrum, but you can see a rather large peak there for the particular photoelectron. And that's what we were trying to investigate when we looked at iron chemistry. So we took iron 3 and then electrochemically reduced it to iron 2. And we could see that we'd done our chemical reaction because the position of the binding energy or the position of the peak moved significantly. And this is the first time that anyone's ever seen this type of information using this type of spectroscopy. I guess the bit that makes this project different and I suppose a big challenge is the incorporation of lots of different areas of knowledge and expertise. The technique itself, XPS, is not new. It's been around for some 30 or 40 years. Electrochemistry is not new and ionic liquid chemistries are not new. But our group has taken our knowledge across these different fields and brought them together so that we can start to answer quite significant research challenges.